It's the turn of the 20th century, and you find yourself in Cincinnati, Ohio. You might head down to League Park and catch a Reds game. Maybe you head over to the Cincinnati Zoo. But there was one thing you couldn't pass up, a trip to Coney Island. This got its start in 1867, when apple farmer James Parker bought 20 acres of land on the Ohio River, and this evolved from a picnic area to a small amusement park. There was a carousel, a dining hall, a dancing hall, and a bowling alley. It was deemed the Coney Island of the West, and in 1887, Coney Island became its official name. It was deemed America's favorite amusement park, and its popularity exploded. Ten roller coasters came and went from 1900 to 1940. It added its own steamboat attraction called the Island Queen, and the park thrived through the late 60s. But being located on the Ohio River had its downsides. Mainly, the park was prone to flooding. This caused management to look to relocate the park somewhere else. They found their spot in Deerfield Township, and the move was underway. But would this new park share the success of the beloved Coney Island? Fifty years later, that park has evolved into something Cincinnati can be proud of, a destination for parkgoers throughout the country, and a bucket list landmark for tourists around the world. This is part one of a five-part documentary celebrating Kings Island on its 50th anniversary. Come with me on this journey over the past five decades to see how this park has become what it is today. Coney Island's 1968 season started with a lot of promise. For its 82nd year, the park was introducing a haunted house, the Olympic Bobs, and a $500,000 log flume, covering over 1,500 feet of track. Within 10 days of the official start of the park's season, an abnormal rainstorm rolled in and overflowed the Ohio River, flooding Coney Island and forcing its closure. This was the latest the park had ever had to deal with flooding, and it had to shut down for Memorial Day. The river was already four feet above flood level, and more rain was on the way. A whole week passed, and park officials were stuck waiting for the river to recede. Ralph Wax, president and general manager of Coney Island, was hoping for a midweek opening, but they were still stuck with at least a 10-day closure during their peak season. Flooding was nothing new. Back in 1964, the park was even submerged in 14 feet of water, but this storm, this late into the year, seemed to be the final straw. In addition, there was limited room for expansion and parking. Gary Wax, the son of Coney Island president Ralph Wax, knew the clock was ticking. It was just a matter of time before this park outgrew its spot along the river, and there was no time like the present to make a change. That year, Coney Island management entered talks with the Taft Broadcasting Company, looking to move the park to a new location. Taft had just acquired the Hanna-Barbera division, and they were looking for a way to promote it. The search was on. In March of 1969, the two sides made their findings public. This would be a 1,200-acre amusement park, 30 miles northeast of Coney Island, 20 miles northeast of Cincinnati, located in Deerfield Township in Warren County. The project was expected to take two or more years. Taft and Coney Island hired consultant Charles Thompson for the project, responsible for work on building Disneyland, Six Flags Over Texas, and Six Flags Over Georgia. Despite this announcement, Ralph Walks promised that Coney Island would operate as usual. In fact, we are going to spend more money on it this year than ever before. He wasn't lying. There was a $1 million expansion program set for 1969. This included a 1,000-seat theater, home of the new Circus 70, and that would put on eight shows every day. This went along with eight new rides, five for adults, including the Sky Slide and the Olympic Bombs, and three for kids. These would go in the Land of Oz and included the Old 99, a train ride. During the week, the park would offer pay one price days, where you could ride everything in the park all day as many times as you want, all for the price of just $4. In April, Taft announced an agreement to buy Coney Island. Taft would acquire all of Coney Island's assets for $6.5 million in stock. The sale was pending approval from Coney Island shareholders and a favorable tax ruling. Officials from Taft stated, Acquisition of Coney is a logical and desirable next step in the progress of the development. The deal was finalized in July, and Coney Island would operate as a division of Taft. The plan was to keep the park open, at least through 1971. In January 1970, Taft elected Ralph Wax as the president and general manager of the Coney Island division, keeping his current position but now under the Taft umbrella. Shortly after, Taft announced March 15th for the groundbreaking ceremonies for the new park valued at $20 million, and expected the park to be open to the public in May of 1972. This was projected to bring in 2 million people in the first year, 
growing by a quarter million in the years to follow, employing 600 to 800 people in its opening year. The park would be located right off Interstate 71, with an interchange to be built right by the park entrance. The park was just one part of an enormous complex Taft had in the cards. The first phase included the park, an expandable motel, and a campsite along the Little Miami River. The second phase would include a convention center right alongside the motel, as well as a golf course, a lodge, a restaurant, and a monorail or a train connecting all of this. Gary Walks and Charles Flatt, longtime managers at Coney Island, were devoting a full-time effort on the design and construction of the new park, with Flatt being named project manager. With all eyes on the new project, Coney Island was still adding to its lineup. In 1970, they debuted the Galaxy, replacing the Wild Mouse Coaster. People flocked to the park, attendance and spending up over 5% from the prior year, with park officials saying it could be Coney's biggest year to date. Meanwhile, the so-called New Coney finally broke ground three months late in mid-June. Still unnamed, some people were calling the complex Kings Mills Park or Twin Oaks. Charles Meacham, chairman of the board of Taft Broadcasting, said, We are confident the recreational complex will be a credit to the whole area and carry on the tradition that Coney Island has had for years. Officials from Coney Island and Taft were on hand for the ceremonies, along with the mayor of Cincinnati, stating, This will have tremendous impact for total growth in our area. Guests were given a tour of the site, presenting the center of the tract as the site of the $1 million one-third replica of the Eiffel Tower. This would be the largest and most expensive feature of the new park. The park would also be made up of four themed areas, Oktoberfest, Old Coney, Rivertown, and Hanna-Barbera World. Guests would enter the park from International Street, made up of two parallel streets, bordering a reflecting pool larger than a football field. Lining International Street would be a variety of shops with European themes, German, Dutch, an English flea market, and a French bazaar. Dudley Taft stated, Even though we are building a modern park, the old Coney Island has been so popular, we want to retain some of that original concept. Old Coney would feature the park's signature ride, the Racer. These twin wooden coasters would operate side by side, combining for 6,100 feet of track. They also promised a Hanna-Barbera dark ride, where guests travel through an enclosed storyland in boats. While construction crews were busy with the new park site, by the end of the summer of 1970, Taft put Coney Island up for sale following the 1971 season. Per Gary Walks, all our time, talent, and manpower will go into the new operation after 1971. We're not entirely sure what will happen to Coney. We do want to sell the grounds to some company for resort facilities. The sale offer was open to anyone interested in the 155-acre park, but Wax noted the marina, swimming pool, and theater would make for a great picnic area. What they do with the property is up to them. We don't expect Coney Island to be an amusement park. Coney Island drew interest from the city to turn it into a public park. Although the aerial tramway and the roller coasters would be taken out, the swimming pool, dance hall, and theater would remain. By the end of the year, this idea got support from the Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana Planning Authority. The remaining attractions left behind would be enough to attract patrons, and their paid admission would offset the price of the park. With all these discussions going down, Coney Island set a new attendance record, drawing in more than 1.1 million guests over the summer. As for the new park, Taft held a contest to find an official name in July. 15,000 entries later, they chose the winner, Kings Island. This combined the name of Kings Mills, where the new park would be located, while paying homage to Coney Island. But it was apparent that Taft officials did not love the name. After choosing the winner, they spent five weeks trying to come up with something better. Taft had bigger plans beyond this park, and wanted a name suitable for a series of parks across the country. They already had a plan to open a sister park on the East Coast in the years to come, taking action on 700 acres north of Richmond, Virginia. As the debate on Coney Island's future continued on, the park opened for its 85th and final season in April of 1971. Taft made a special effort to give the park a proper send-off, booking special events on the calendar, along with free concerts from local high school bands, and 10 nights of fireworks to end the season. It is easy to imagine that these generations of Cincinnatians, in whose lives Coney Island has played so significant a role, will do their bit to make Coney's 85th season its greatest. Park officials plan on moving everything they could from Coney Island to Kings Island, including all of the portable rides, the log flume, the equipment in the Land of Oz, and the Sky Ride would be moved, but it would receive new cars from Switzerland. As for the famed roller coaster, Shooting Star, Wax said it would be dismantled and burned. A flea market was planned to auction off everything that couldn't be moved, but park officials canceled it. They realized that everything would either be moved or need to be left for the new buyers. In May, a preview exhibit was set up at Coney Island to showcase the new Kings Island, introducing the park to the Coney patrons with a scale model. Over the years, Coney became more than a park, more than just a magical fantasy land of fun and thrills and breathless wonder for anyone with a handful of tickets. Coney became a symbol of all that was carefree and good and fun in life. Problems and worries waited outside as people danced and swirled and laughed inside. Tommy West, Cincinnati Inquirer.
On September 6, 1971, 20,000 people braved the rain to give Coney Island a final send-off. The day prior, the park set an all-time record with 31,000 guests. They say the park opened in the rain back in 1886. It was only appropriate it rained on the closing date as well. After 85 years, the lights were officially turned out on Coney Island. Less than eight hours after the park closed, workers began dismantling the park. It was scheduled for a six-week plan to move or scrap everything. 13 of the 31 rides would make their way to Kings Island. In mid-October, James Figley, director of maintenance, said, We were genuinely surprised to find how easy the rides were to tear down. To date, we have moved most of the rides, and by November 1st, we plan to have the old rides installed. This even includes 35 ginkgo trees transplanted to the new Coney Mall section of the park. With Coney Island closed, all eyes were on Kings Island. Jack Nicholas announced that he would build a $1.2 million golf course adjacent to Kings Island, featuring a main course and executive course, both 18 holes. This would be ready for the summer of 1972 to coincide with the park's opening. The Eiffel Tower was complete in May, and the paint job was set to begin. 800 gallons of green paint, 10,000 pieces on the tower, all painted with a brush from the 340-foot peak on down. They also had to build around an abandoned graveyard in the parking lot, and bulldoze a house after a legal fight. Kings Island, now valued at $30 million, said its preview begins to start April 29th, with the grand opening on May 27th. Admission would be $6 for adults, $5 after 6 p.m., and officials claim the park could handle 75,000 people per day without excessive wait times. The park announced it was taking applications for 1,500 summer jobs, and there was an eight-hour line of applicants the first two days. The park was staffed and ready for its first preview day, right on schedule. But like Coney Island's first day and last day, Kings Island was greeted with rain. Only about 4,000 people came through the gates on April 29th, with no traffic jam coming off I-71 and no lines in front of the rides, with the exception of the Racer and Eiffel Tower. Some rides had no names in front of them, and many of the ones that were open were running slow. Still, many of the guests were impressed with the vast amusement park. I had to see if it had anything on Coney. It does. It has everything on Coney. Lane Evan. Others were noticing the bad differences between Kings Island and Coney Island. One guest noted that Kings Island did not allow picnic baskets in the park, something that was an important part of Coney Island's culture. The park used the next month to smooth things out, and by May 27th, it was ready for its grand opening. <music> opening ceremonies for the park kicked off at 10 a.m. in front of 5,000 people. 1,000 employees paraded down International Street with five marching bands, two Fred Flintstone rockmobiles, fireworks, and 20,000 balloons released at the end. By the early afternoon, there were 12,000 people in the park. By the end of the day, 18,000 people had passed through the gates. The consensus seemed to be it's almost too much to see in one day. The park had 23 rides and shows for adults, nine of them coming from Coney Island. This included the Sky Ride, the Rotor, Flying Carpet, Monster, Scrambler, Grand Carousel, Cuddle Up, Flying Eagles, and one roller coaster, the Bavarian Beetle. This was the Galaxy Coaster that opened in 1970. The original rides included the Kings Island and Miami Valley Railroad, Der Spin and Kagers, Halley's Comet, Les Taxis, Auto Livery, Wheel of Fortune, Kenton Cove's Canoes, Shawnee Landing, The Enchanted Voyage, Eiffel Tower, and the star attraction, The Racer. There was also the Royal Fountain Bandstand, the Kings Island Theater, and the Aqua Arena for marine animal shows. In the happy land of Hanna-Barbera, there were 11 rides, plus the Hanna-Barbera Amphitheater, the two most notable ones being the King's Mills Log Flume, relocated from Coney Island, and Scooby-Doo, a small family wooden coaster. There would also be costume characters from the Hanna-Barbera world throughout the park, including Scooby-Doo, the Flintstones, and most of all, the Banana Splits. King's Island was popular right out of the gate, and it drew some immediate attention. Within two weeks of its grand opening, the Partridge family agreed to film at least one episode at the park that summer. The ABC TV series would be the first network exposure for King's Island, the first summer was a smashing success. Over its first month and a half, Kings Island had outperformed Coney Island's normal performance by 66% in attendance and doubled their earnings. As task president, Lawrence Rogers said, Kings Island is living up to the hopes that it would be a place of laughter and joy. Laughter for the patrons and joy on the part of management. Not surprisingly, Taft and top value enterprises decided to proceed with the park in Richmond, Virginia, with Kings Island general manager Gary Wax taking the same role with that project. He would move to Richmond, being replaced by Edward McHale, the one millionth guest passed through the turnstiles in July, and she and her family were given three free days at the park, motel reservations, free golf at the Jack Nicholas courses, and $100 spending money. 
The park capped off its first season with a fireworks spectacle, moving to weekend-only operation. This included Senior Citizens Days on Sundays in September, where guests aged 60 or older could get in for just $3. One woman was said to blow off paying all her utilities and come to the park, using the last $3.50 to her name to get in, hitchhiking the whole way there, and the park employees gave her the royal treatment, even giving her a ride home at the end of the night. Kings Island was endearing itself to its new community and trying to win over the Coney Island diehards, the ones who felt slighted that their charming little park was replaced. Although I cherish fond memories of Coney and always will, Kings Island is certainly the Tiffany of amusement parks. Mary Wood, Cincinnati Post. By the time the park closed for the year in late October, Kings Island had brought in at least one guest from every single one of the 50 U.S. states. More than 2 million people came to Warren County to visit the park, creating an economic boom for hotels, restaurants, and other shops. There were as many as 1,500 people working at the park during the summer, tallying a payroll of $4.25 million. Their first season of 1972 was everything everyone thought it could be, and more. It was time to expand. During the off-season, the Kings Island Inn added 80 rooms. The park also signed a lease with the California-based Lion Country Safari, bringing live animals to the park. This would be an upcharge for the park when it was open, and would operate as a separate entity in the off-season, set to debut in 1974. The park also held open auditions for over 200 live performers the next season. These would be singers, dancers, actors, and musicians, performing in more than 15 areas of the park. As 1973 kicked off, the Partridge Family episode filmed at the park aired on January 26. Gary Walks was named Vice President of the Kings Island Kings Dominion Family Entertainment Centers, the new park in Richmond having adopted its official name and set to open in 1975. The park reached out to the community for 1,500 workers for a second season, but crews were working tirelessly all winter, implementing all the additions that came along with a $6 million expansion. This included a restaurant over the main gate, overlooking the park's International Street. This would be open year-round. There would also be three new rides. The Bayern Curve, a Schwarzkopf circular bobsled, the Flying Dutchman, a swing ride with gondolas shaped as wooden shoes, and Kenton's Cove Keelboat Canal, a hydro flume. Rounding out the additions was a games and arcade building and a half-mile nature trail. Edward McHale projected 2.2 million guests in 1973, about a 10% increase. Opening weekend had a host of special events, including a parade, a hot air balloon race, a team of four skydivers, the human fly climbing up the Eiffel Tower, Air Force jets doing a flyover, and a fireworks show every night at 10 p.m. The crowds poured in, over the first month and a half in 1973, the park had a 30% increase in attendance and a 38% increase in net revenue. Kings Island's 3 millionth visitor came to the park in July, presented with a plaque by a skydiver, got a ride in the hot air balloon, plus other prizes. The Lion Country Safari was getting geared up to storm the park the next year, with 16 zebras and a dozen rhinos arriving at the park at the end of the summer. Following the lead of the Partridge family, the Brady Bunch shot an episode at the park in August. The year ended with kids under 12 getting free admission if they arrived in a full Halloween costume with the park decked out in Halloween decorations and costume characters. It was a fine way to end a season that outpaced their own projections, pulling in 2.3 million people and earning $1 million more in profits from his opening year. Over at Coney Island, Taft decided to take the park off the market. They wanted $3.5 million for the land, a price too high for public use, and private developers were scared off by the flooding issue. They decided to turn the land into a pay-for-play recreational park, fit for recreational vehicles, and right away, they looked into installing tennis courts and a mini golf course. When Paul Ilyinsky came out with his tribute to Coney Island, Goodbye Coney Island Goodbye, Kings Island bought 320 hardbound copies and gave them to local schools. They wanted young students who visit the new park to know what the old park was like. 1974 kicked off with a price hike for admission, going from $6 to $7. This was also under the backdrop of an energy shortage. Following OPEC's oil embargo that started the prior October, Taft was confident that Kings Island would not suffer, being within 150 miles of 10.5 million people, and 83% of their attendance already came from that area. The Lion Country Safari was their big new draw, but there were other reasons to visit the park in 1974. Carl Walenda broke the world high wire walk record, covering 1,800 feet, 60 feet above the ground, lasting 29 minutes and even doing two headstands along the way. Firestone also sponsored a new air show, where the Kings Island hot air balloon would rise up and small planes would do aerobatics around it. Kings Island enjoyed another record year, with 2.6 million people coming to the park. Taft believed the gas shortage would not hurt the park, and they were vindicated. 70% of the gas came from Ohio, up 12% over the prior year, and profits rose over 20%. They would press forward with $3.5 million in park improvements, highlighted by a 130-foot double Ferris wheel called Zodiac, as well as a Huss spinning ride called Troika. Lion Country Safari would open a 1,500-seat amphitheater for an exotic bird show. The safari would remain open during the off-season, charging $3 for adults and $1.75 for kids. There was also an unexpected expense that arose in the winter. On December 1st, the Kings Island Theater collapsed under heavy snow and had to be rebuilt. 
The 1975 season saw the first step in attendance in the park's four-year history, but the small decrease was not enough to hurt the park's bottom line. The price for parking was doubled, from 50 cents to a dollar, and with increased prices for food and merchandise, gross revenues were slightly up. Taft officials were not worried. Charles Meacham said, It is now clear that Kings Island is an established, successful operation and will achieve a long-term growth pattern which will continue to make it an excellent investment. Aside from the new rides and shows, the park featured country stars Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn, but the big draw in 1975 was Evil Knievel. He was going to cap off the year on October 25th by jumping over 14 buses in the Kings Island parking lot, claiming this to be his final jump of his career. Kings Island was selling tickets in advance for $12 to see the jump and visit the park. $8 just to see the jump. The jump would be televised on ABC's Wide World of Sports, blacked out in Cincinnati, Dayton, and Columbus. This was because the park was building the largest temporary arena in U.S. history, seating 70,000 people. Once the day of the jump came around, only 25,000 filled the seats. It was a cold, blustery day, and his jump fell well short of the mark, landing on the plywood that covered the last three buses. Needing 30 to 35,000 just to break even, Kings Island took a loss on the event. But there was one major silver lining, the ABC Wide World of Sports broadcast brought in 32 million viewers, the largest audience in the show's 15-year history. This gave Kings Island an unprecedented level of national exposure. 1976 started with another hike in the admission price, from $7 to $8, along with a 50-cent surcharge for the Lion Country Safari. The Safari would feature some new additions, 10 Bengal Tigers and 50 Olive Baboons. But as exciting as new animals can be, they can pose unique challenges. Eleven days before the park opened for the season, the 50 baboons escaped their enclosure. The park used food traps to lure them back in, but by opening day, 13 were still on the loose. One of them was believed to have left the park, but the others were roaming the general park area. Park officials said the baboons were not dangerous unless cornered, and fully intended on opening the park on time. It took a couple weeks, but the park was able to catch the final two baboons, using food laced with a tranquilizer. 48 of the baboons were shipped back to the Animal Exchange in Michigan. The other two remained in their preserve. The sign on their cage read, Here are a few of the baboons that made monkeys out of us. More serious was an incident in July, when a 20-year-old safari ranger was mauled and killed by lions. The rangers were told to never leave their cage like jeeps, but it appears he broke protocol. Investigators believe he left the jeep to relieve himself, and was killed by lions trying to get back to his jeep. OSHA would fine the park $2,400 for safety violations, reduced to $800 once the park showed they were taking steps to ensure this would never happen again. The park also introduced the American Heritage Music Hall, a $1.8 million theater with nine shows every day, as well as the Follies Marionette Show. But Taft was always thinking outside the box, and they wanted a whole new attraction for the Kings Island Complex. They made an agreement with the College Football Hall of Fame to locate adjacent to the park. With the park already bringing in 2.5 million people a year, with the goal of 3.5 million in the future, they figured if 10% of those people visited the Hall of Fame, it would be profitable. They had only developed half of his 1,600 acres and felt like the park and the hall would benefit from each other. Instead of being a one-day pit stop, the Kings Island complex could grow into a multi-day destination. The groundbreaking ceremony took place in August, slated for a 1978 opening. The two-story building would cover 38,000 square feet on a plot of land spanning 10 acres and including a football field. By the end of the year, Edward McHale was promoted within TAS Amusement Park Group, leaving the general manager job to William Price, the director of marketing. Despite a tumultuous year, attendance and revenue were up. The park said goodbye to Cuddle Up, a Coney Island original flat ride, as well as Shawnee Landing, the canoe ride. But for the first time in the park's short history, a new coaster was on the horizon, described as a 360-degree looping roller coaster, with four cars, 16 passenger trains along 500 feet of track at 45 miles per hour, through a 56-foot high, 360-degree vertical loop, up a second 50-foot incline. Then, after a pause, the riders are catapulted through a loop to the starting point, backwards. This was Scream and Demon, a brand new model from Aerodynamics, the company behind the first modern inverting coaster one year prior, and now introducing a launch shuttle coaster. This was one of three being introduced for 1977. There would also be a new facility called Stadium of the Stars for celebrity entertainers, as well as a new show called Hooray for Hollywood, a musical salute to the silver screen. They opened the season with a 50s rock and roll weekend featuring Dick Clark, and ended the season with their country music celebration. In the park's final few days, President Jimmy Carter's brother, Billy Carter, made an appearance for the so-called Peanut Olympics, featuring six Peanut-themed events. The one mishap during the season happened right off the bat in April, as the sky ride broke down in a wind and rainstorm, stranding 45 people for up to eight hours waiting for the fire department to rescue them. In the end, despite the new coaster, attendance was down 1%, but spending was up 11%. The King's Island Theater that collapsed three years prior and was repaired was retired for good after the 1977 season, replaced by Tower Gardens. 
1978 also brought in four new live shows, as well as penguins to the freshly renamed Wild Animal Safari. The College Football Hall of Fame was dedicated in early August, drawing in almost 3,500 people over its first four days, a promising sign. Not so promising was the future of Bavarian Beetle. The park was being sued by an 87-year-old man whose neck was broken after riding the coaster. In October, the case was sent to the Ohio Supreme Court, but the Bavarian Beetle was gone by then. In the middle of the 1978 season, the coaster was removed in favor for a Ferris wheel, Kings Island's first coaster to be removed. While Kings Island was removing a coaster, the rival to the north was adding one. Cedar Point, located on Lake Erie in northern Ohio, had just opened the world's tallest coaster, Gemini, an aerodynamic dual hybrid coaster, standing 125 feet tall. But Kings Island had come this far, going big every step of the way, and they were about to unveil a new coaster, one that was not only unprecedented for its time, it remains a record holder to this day. To this a record day. holder. A record holder to this day. <laughs> Thanks for watching episode one of this five part documentary. If you could drop a like and share this video with anyone who may be interested, I would appreciate it. This is a massive project and I really appreciate the support. I also want to thank everyone who provided the visuals for this video, including the photo gallery of Bob Joyner, among others. Stay tuned next week for episode two, as Kings Island cements its legacy as one of the coaster capitals of the world.